Excellencies, friends and colleagues around the world, welcome to the high-level international conference, Global Progress Towards Nonviolent Childhoods, Putting Prohibition of Corporal Punishment into Practice. I'm Laila Khandokar, working with Save the Children. Before we start, a few housekeeping announcements. Interpretation is available in French, Spanish, and English. You can select the channel at the bottom of your screen. Please do introduce yourself in the chat and post any questions for speakers and in the Q&A and chat boxes. We hope to pick up on some of those later on. Please also note this meeting is being recorded. Corporal punishment violates children's dignity and physical integrity and is a serious violation of their rights under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Around four in five children between the ages of two and four are subjected to some kind of violent discipline in the home. Huge amount of scientific research has clearly demonstrated the negative outcomes of corporal punishment, which affects children's physical and psychological health, cognitive development and education, and also damages parent-child relationship. 40 years ago, only one state had prohibited corporal punishment of children in all settings. That includes homes, schools, workplaces, alternative care arrangements, institutions, etc. But today, close to a third of all UN member states have taken this state. It is being recognized as a basic requirement for a good child protection approach. However, 87% of world's children are not protected from corporal punishment by law. Banning corporal punishment in all settings has become even more urgent during the COVID-19 pandemic as this has placed millions of children everywhere at a greater risk of violence at home. From my experience of working in various countries in Asia, Africa, and the Pacific, I know that any initiative on full legal prohibition of corporal punishment is usually met with resistance by parents, teachers, community members, and policymakers. But research is showing that law reform has led to reduced acceptance of corporal punishment in society. We also know that positive parenting programs promote nonviolent child rearing practices and changes perceptions and attitudes among parents, caregivers, and other people working with children. I have noted that in different countries due to my own work on nonviolent parenting. Ending corporal punishment is a human rights imperative and also essential if the world is to meet the Sustainable Development Goal Target 16.2 to end all violence against children by 2030. This year's Together to End Violence campaign, led by the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, is calling on governments to commit to introducing legislation to prohibit all corporal punishment by the end of 2022 if they haven't already done so. All states should achieve prohibition of corporal punishment in all settings by 2030 and should accelerate measures to eliminate corporal punishment from children's lives. Two high level conferences are being organized. The first one, prohibiting all corporal punishment of children, laying foundations for nonviolent childhoods, was held on 30th April. 437 individuals from 75 countries attended the event. The conference was co-sponsored by the governments of Japan, France, and Tunisia, and featured 10 inspiring speakers, including leaders from the government and the United Nations, civil society, academia, and youth activists. Each speaker explored ending corporal punishment from a different angle, but all agree that universal prohibition must be achieved if we are to end violence for good. Achieving full legal prohibition of corporal punishment is important. This has to be enforced also. Today's conference will share good practices in implementing the ban from diverse countries and communities. A new implementation guidance will be launched at the conference today. In the first part of the event, we shall hear from the representatives of the governments of Mongolia, Honduras, Romania, and the Council of Baltic Sea States. Then we shall have time for panel discussion. After that, there will be presentations from academics and practitioners from the field. This will be followed by another panel discussion. Now we shall watch a pre-recorded video by Ms. Arwin Jaya Ayush, Minister for Labor and Social Protection, Mongolia. She will share experience and learning on promoting child rights and ending corporal punishment.
distinguished delegates on behalf of the 1.3 million children of Mongolia, which are third of the population, I would like to extend my warm greetings to the entire participants. I am pleased to inform you that Mongolia has ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child during the critical period of social and economic transition, which laid the foundation of Mongolia's child protection system. Mongolia became the 49th country in the world and the second in the Asia which has legalized prohibition of violence against children in every social aspect by adopting a law on the protection of the rights of the child in 1996, amendments to the law on education in 2006, and the law on child protection, the law on the rights of the child, and the law on combating domestic violence in 2016. This is a major step forward in child protection and human rights, not only in Mongolia, but also in the region. In the 30 years since ratification of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the government of Mongolia has submitted a national report five times to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. At present, we have been implementing fifth recommendation given by the committee. Children aged under 18 years old make up 36.8% of the total population of Mongolia. Of total children, 2.7% are semi-orphans, 0.3% are full orphans, and 1% are child, uh, children with disabilities. The government of Mongolia has approved a national program for child development and protection, ensured intersectorial coordination in the protection of children's rights and risk prevention, expanded cooperation between government civil society organizations and international organizations, um, strengthened the child protection system. Expenditures on child development and protection services financed from the state budget have increased 12 times compared to previous four years, reaching to 8 billion. In addition, local and other child protection budgets have increased. The National Council on Rights uh, on Children Rights, headed by Prime Minister himself, was established at national level and sub-councils uh, sub at local level in order to ensure intersectorial coordination in accordance with law on children's rights. In addition, an um, intersectorial working group headed by Deputy Minister of Labor and Social Protection is also established. The National Council has approved child protection policy in the guidance of Parents Council and been ensuring coordination and implementation of integrated child protection policy. Technical Committee for Standardization of Child Development and Protection Services um, have been established in order to ensure mainstreaming of uh, child protection issues into each and every child-related service standards. Following uh, measures are taken by the government of Mongolia to create and um, strengthen national child protection system, uh, such as uh, Child Helpline uh, 108, has been set uh, up to provide child protection information and um, advice, receive re emergency calls and provide services. The call center received, um, receives and um, uh, resolves up to 200 calls um, per year. Established a training, research and information center to build the capacity of human resources working in the field of child and family protection, ensuring evidence-based policy planning. As also, uh, we've established a legal committee for the rights of uh, the child, um, which is uh, responsible for protecting and uh, advising on the rights of child victims, um, perpetrators and suspects under in investigation. Um, multidisciplinary teams are working uh, to provide primary care at risk children uh, uh, as also victims of uh, domestic violence. Um, as also we have uh, established um, uh, monitoring uh, for implementation of children's rights, state inspectors for children's rights um, uh, who are working to prevent and resolve violation of children's rights. 
In addition, a child inspector uh, position was added within the structure of the police department. Currently, there are um, more than uh, 200 child protectors, um, or the inspectors are working uh, at the police um, uh, police uh, agency. Uh, 21-stop service centers and 17 temporary shelters are in place to ensure the safety of domestic violence victims. And we are providing the necessary uh, services there. We are also uh, developing a platform na named uh, eHelp, uh, translated eHelp, um, eCare. Uh, it is database to collect information and uh, service results on uh, one-stop service center and temporary shelters. Uh, also, integrated database on children's rights information were established within the purpose to improve registration and um, collection of the information on children at risk, children living in care centers, um, child jockeys, um, and children attending children camps and prevention and response services. Um, child Protector uh, project has been implemented in order to ensure civic uh, civil uh, society engagement and cooperation in child protection as a result of the project child right violation cases have been increased or um, I mean uh, have been decreased uh, by five percent as also uh, um, by five percent in 2019 uh, by 30 percent in 2020. In 2019, the government approved a regulation on the protection of children's rights in assistance in emergencies, established an intersectorial group to ensure coordination. Um, um, coordination. Um, the positive um, discipline approach program uh, was one of the several uh, measures that we have implemented to prevent potential risks to children and educate the public. Mongolia has been celebrating an international day to end corporal punishment of children on uh, 30th April. Um, started already uh, in 2006. An external evaluation was conducted to monitor the effectiveness of the implementation of the law on the child rights and the law on child protection and the results of the evaluation have uh, uh, laid that, um, the foundation to further improve the legal environment, uh, social service methodology and the intersectorial coordination. In addition to protecting the rights of children living in the country, we are focusing to protect the rights of our children living and studying abroad. Uh, in this, we are preparing to ratify the Hague Convention on Protection of Children and cooperation in respect of um, inter-country adoption and um, its optional uh, protocol. So with this, I thank you for your attention. I would like to uh, request Vice Minister Alejandra hernandez Juan, Under Secretariat of Prevention, Honduras, and Nancy Suniga from UNICEF Honduras to share learning. They will talk about the practical measures taken to implement the legal prohibition of corporal punishment. Greetings from Honduras to all of you. Um, well, we will talk about the approach and experience and learning about uh, putting provision and corporal punishment into practice in our country. We are placed in the heart of Central America and, and our information about our population is that we are more than 9 million people living in Honduras a little bit mostly women, more than men. Uh, and But what we talk about our population of youth is a 3.4 million, almost 40% of our population is, is um, 18 years old or younger. So according to uh, the International Institution of Statistics. What, our, what about our law says is that it's forbidden for parents and any person in charge of personal care on bringing education, treatment, and surveillance 
to be there temporarily or permanently to use physical punishment or any type of humiliating, degrading, cruel, and inhuman as any form of correction or discipline of children, girls, or adolescents. It's, it's important also to mention that uh, according to the Violence Against Children and Adolescents Survey, vaxxed uh, launches in Honduras in 2019, uh, mostly one of every th uh, three children has, has experienced physical violence before the age of 18 years. So it's a major, major concern for our government, for our population, for parents, and also, of course, to the decisions uh, makers. So we work especially from the uh, police institution and from the secretary of, of security to work on the peace, justice, and strong institutions. But it's also important to tell you that from our role, we also work for another sustainable development goals, talking about this and work and economic growth with, uh, with youth, also uh, good health and well being quality education specialized on children, gender equality, and partnership for goals. And this has been very important working with the other institution in alliance and also with other governments and other, and other partners outside of the government. Our prevention, peace, and coexistence guidelines that we work from the, by, from the, our prevention <laughs> Uh, office is the culture of peace, citizen and coexistence, humans and human rights. We work also from the prevention from the local with the terror with the territorial vision, working with uh, all the communities, uh, working with the majors. It's a very important uh, policy for us because they have different local problems, and that is how our approach is is different. We also. Um, we also work in the prevention against children and adolescents. This is the most work that we that we have to focus, and we work a lot in schools. This is very important for us to work with the institutions that are in charge in the different uh, problems that they have, and but especially focusing in every kind of prevention of violence that can affect them inside the school, in the outside the school with their parents and, and all the community uh, work out together. We also work in sustainable and, res and resilient safe places. So we have like good environments for them. So also we can prevent them from being victims from a gang violence. Uh, this is very important in our context. And also we work prevention of gender violence, uh, working uh, for kids from girls, and this has been a good policy for us to be implemented. And we have also uh, another guideline that is the rehabilitation, reintegration, and care of, 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 our, of our youth and children. So we work on different communications strategies, and we have this campaign called Apapachame, it's a different pronouncing name, but it's a uh, call from like hugs, like from affection, like uh, being always there to hug someone and to be caring from there. So this, this campaign has been very important for, uh, for talking to parents about uh, how to avoid corporal punishment, how to educate them in another ways to, to make discipline, to be, uh, around those children to this campaign talks about like playing with them at, uh, at least one moment every day that to be uh, caring from your children from your girls every moment that that is very important so there are some social norms that include in the communication strategy for this development they are things that have been said that they are, have been wrong from generation and uh, they are transmitted still like, like girls and boys 
have to grow, uh, they grow spoiled and, and rebellious without punishment. So we have to work to, uh, to, to destroy this kind of information of the population minds, uh, turning them in another, in another way to, to, to treat children and to speak to them too. So they don't tell them they are fools. So they are, uh, they, they, we have to work with their parents so they can know how to work with their, with their children, how to be an act and, and how to take care of them. But also our campaign talks about, uh, about how to work with authorities, how to, we have to protect ourselves uh, together and the, how is the use, for example, of the 911 number, how to make complaints, where can you make safe uh, complaints to the police and that there are other institutions that can help you with medical care, with, uh, with any kind of, of advisement uh, that can help really a situation where there is violence involved in the, uh, especially inside the family. So uh, uh, we work like to work with love and try to do respect as a, as a transversal thing to also we, we adapt this to this uh, pandemia about uh, what is the child abuse online and what are the risks that we have now that, uh, that children have more access to the um, to the computers and to, and to all the data that is uh, that is getting from there. So these different uh, factors that have uh, been applied to us are very important. So we're also providing important information from them for, uh, <clears throat> for how to work in this in this context. So uh, we also um, we also involve. Uh, with our uh, with our office to offer online like things that we can share together as a family like maybe we can cook together or make exercise together so they have a good health and and sharing we talk about different things about their generation things that they can uh, like like they can learn but in 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 a special way that is is not like boring but it's like interesting from there. Uh, that is the kind of work that we do. And we have to take a lot of, uh, of, of information and factors that are different, like what is our public, what are the age, and how, how do we reach them in different social networks. So we're national action plans and, and next phases is that we have initiated uh, this action plan, uh, action plan to uh, prevent every kind of violence that affects uh, children. We work as uh, based on Inspire model uh, that contemplates uh, the different uh, pillars of change of social norms. So we are strengthening the, strengthening the prevention of physical punishment in a different way for girls and adolescents. And uh, we have strengthened the prevention of physical uh, punishment through the platform of schools including the initiative of Safer School that has been one of our major priorities in this theme. Thank you. So we can share with Nancy too a little bit of, of words for you. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra. Yes, I just want to add a key couple of things. One of them is uh, for us, it's very important to keep the linkage between punishment, physical, physical punishment and how this, uh, this is the way uh, where we learn submission and, where we're, and, when, and where children learn about uh, abuse of power and how this also um, uh, complicates the way we really uh, do better to um, resolve problems and conflicts. And at the end, how the same behaviors we see at home or when they are in the schools. So for us, it's very important that the models that we have at home uh, change. Yeah, and how 
people and how fa parents begin to understand that a punishment have an increased violence in the country. Uh, the other thing that uh, maybe uh, it's a good thing for the unit Ale Ale Alejandra leads is that police is right now uh, going to be trained and incorporated in the curricula, a child protection uh, module that will really uh, is trying to uh, incorporate new ways of, uh, of working with the police or how the police understand uh, those kind of behaviors. Thank you. Thank you again <laughs> to you. Uh, and uh, such an, a strong national program in Honduras, it's so inspiring uh, for all of us. And thanks, uh, Nancy, also. Uh, our next speaker is Olivia Lind Helderson, Head of Children at Risk Unit, Council of Baltic Sea States. Uh, I'm requesting Olivia to make a presentation. Uh, she will talk about progress towards nonviolent childhoods in the Baltic Sea States region. Thank you very much, uh, Laila, and uh, thank you very much for organizing this event here today. It's a delight to be among so many uh, champions and hardworking people for the ban and for the implementation of the ban. Uh, I hope that you can see my screen and that it is in the form of a slideshow. Um, so let me begin by introducing the Council of the Baltic Sea States. Uh, the CBSS uh, is a platform for regional collaboration and mutual trust, which gathers 11 member states uh, around the Baltic Sea region and representatives from the EU. And Children at Risk is one of the flagship priorities. And our expert group with representatives from ministries uh, on children gather representatives to promote national child protection systems, child-friendly justice, and international collaboration on law, policy, and guidance to end all forms of violence against children. And the UN Convention is a very strong foundation for our joint efforts in the region. And uh, we are extremely proud that 10 out of 11 countries in our region have uh, prohibited uh, physical and humiliating punishment by law. And uh, of course, even though we have such uh, broad legal coverage, our region is very diverse. And while some countries have almost 40 years of experience in implementing the ban, others have just embarked on this uh, journey. But th despite this diversity, uh, these countries have really come together and inspired and learned from each other and good practice has been promoted and reinforced through dialogue and practical projects. And it is this positive experience of sharing and the power of that that I would like to convey to you today. So a few years ago, the CBSS coordinated a project to promote the full implementation of legal bans on corporal punishment in our region. And we worked with ministries in Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Sweden, and Poland, and in close collaboration with the Global Initiative to end all corporal punishment of children. And I'd like to share a few key lessons learned from that project, some of which have already been echoed by other speakers here today, and also direct you to our guidance with hopes that it might uh, inspire you. Uh, so I warn you, get ready for a whistle stop tour, uh, but please don't hesitate to connect with us uh, today or after the conference if you have uh, more questions. So I think the absolute most important lesson from our region is that it is possible to change attitudes and behavior. All countries in our region report that there has been a positive impact 
of the prohibition in terms of prevalence of violence and attitudes towards corporal punishment of children. For example, in Sweden, half of the children were subject to corporal punishment in the 70s. In 2016, this had dropped to only a few percent. In Finland, adult acceptance of corporal punishment went down from 47% in 1981 to 13% in 2017. In Latvia in 2010, 42% of surveyed adults said that corporal punishment in the home should be forbidden. And in 2017, this had gone up to 51%. And in Germany in 1992, some 30% of children had experienced corporal punishment. And this had gone down to 3% in 2002. And finally, in Poland, between 2008 and 2017, the approval rate for corporal punishment dropped by 14%, and the disapproval rate rose by 19%. So there has been a lot of progress, but clearly we recognize that there is always uh, still much to do. And we learned a lot from our project. An important lesson learned is that implementation of the law requires ongoing, long-term and comprehensive activities political and cultural and socioeconomic tendencies and trends that have an impact on how we view children as rights holders and also uh, how we perceive corporal punishment, they are fluid and they can change in all directions over time. And another key learning is that it's not enough to implement isolated and sporadic activities. What we're essentially doing is that we're building a society broad consensus that corporal punishment no longer is acceptable in our societies. And with that, we're trying to change behavior that often has very strong roots in our societies. And this yeah, it requires a comprehensive and sustainable approach. And it requires involving governments, national authorities, civil society, academia, faith groups, ombudspersons, you have it, all stakeholders towards a clear and common objective. And the action we learned must range from universal action to very specific and targeted interventions. And let me just mention a few of those interventions. So in terms of campaigns, we learned that non-judgmental campaigns and positive messages have the strongest impact. And in particular, if they manage to establish a dialogue which focuses on the harm that violence has on both children and adults, uh, the value of communication, uh, the value of sharing warmth and respect, such as we have seen from previous speakers. And we also learned that special efforts must be made to reach the most vulnerable and hard to reach, including migrants, for example. We also learned that positive parenting programs should reflect children's rights, that they should be rights-based because the perception of children as rights holders goes hand in hand with the implementation of the ban. ban. Multidisciplinary and interagency cooperation was identified as absolutely essential for early identification, referral and follow-up. In our region, we have something called Barnahus. Um, and there were really strong signals in our region that service models can achieve notable success in reducing and preventing corporal punishment. They can strengthen families and they can prevent family separation, especially 
when the services play a facilitating role that empowers families, parents, children to assume responsibilities themselves. We saw that the role of media had a great impact across the countries in the region. Uh, reports about violence against children and um, uh, generating uh, open and public debates were in most cases crucial uh, in building consensus uh, around the legal ban. Sustainable and active political support was extremely important across the region. Uh, political in the political statement in support, they really constitute important signals that the ban is high on the political agenda and that violence against children is unacceptable. Continued law reform that strengthens children's rights across sectors uh, that supports the implementation of the ban, for example, strengthening children's rights in criminal codes and procedural safeguards had an impact. Uh, law reform and national plans that clarified reporting obligations uh, also helped ensure proactive reporting and referral. And national strategies are absolutely central to ensure a structured and systematic action. And a key lesson from our region is that they work best when they are drawn up involving actors from all relevant sectors, uh, when they clearly define roles and responsibilities, and when they are funded both at national and local level. And I would like to direct you to one good practice example, uh, the Finnish Action Plan for the Prevention of Violence, which was published in 2019 and includes 93 different measures for prevention and uh, minimizing harmful impact and providing treatment. Uh, it's very inspiring, so I, I, I really recommend it. A key lesson uh, is that there must be continued monitoring and evaluation of prevalence, action and collaboration. And it's therefore crucial to have solid uh, data collection mechanisms in place. And finally, uh, the involvement of children is absolutely fundamental. Uh, to understand uh, prevalence and forms and to develop innovative uh, solutions. And a key learning from the children that were involved in our uh, project was that they still need to know more about violence and where to report. And that includes in countries where the ban has been in place for a long time. And children also told us that they want to be supported in their roles as peers. It's often friends and siblings that know and hear first about violence and helplines are really important. So that is the whistle stop tour. Um, I hope that you've been able to take something with you from it and uh, uh, if I have inspired you to continue to explore some of the key change makers uh, in our region, I'd like to direct you to our guidance. You can see them here on the screen and also the web page where you can find them. And obviously, I also want to recommend and support the handbook that is launched here uh, today, which also looks closer at some of the steps that we have identified as change makers in our region. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Olivia, but what an excellent presentation. And uh, it's really great to hear your experience from the Baltic Sea States region. I have so many questions for you, but probably I will just ask one, which we have discussed uh, before also when we talked. I know you have been pursuing this Barnahus model uh, very actively, and uh, there are lots of good experience. Could you please elaborate a little bit on the Barnahus model and what will happen when a case of corporal punishment is first identified? Of course, I'll be happy to. And because I got a uh, um, warning about this, I actually added this slide to, to my presentation. Uh, it is an illustration of the Barnahus model. And you know that 
uh, today there is really an increasing recognition that uh, multidisciplinary collaboration is fundamental to ensuring the rights of child victims of violence uh, to protection and participation, support and assistance. And the Barna House uh, originates from the Baltic Sea region, and Barna House means an, a house for children. And it has been internationally recognized as a leading child friendly multidisciplinary model, which gathers all relevant services under one roof to provide a coordinated, effective and child friendly response. And there are other similar models, uh, for example, the child advocacy centers. So um, the key purpose of this setup is uh, to reduce the number of times uh, that a child must tell their story. Uh, so that you can prevent uh, traumatization or re-traumatization and ensure a uh, comprehensive, competent and child-friendly uh, response. And that is by specialist professionals and hopefully preventing undue delay. And the Barna House is often described as a house with four rooms set in a multidisciplinary setting. And if you look at the image here, you can see that we have the child at the center and then that the house gathers social services, medical staff, therapeutic staff and law enforcement under this roof. And the Barna House then carries out an assessment of protection needs, medical evaluation, therapy and crisis support and an investigative interview. And the child tells the story one time with the relevant sectors watching the interview. And the house is placed and organized in a way that makes children feel safe and comfortable so that they are enabled to uh, disclose, but also fully benefit from the services that are providing, uh, provided to them. And beyond carrying out their specific roles, the different agencies meet in interagency meetings, they share interagency planning and case uh, management. And Barna House has been set up uh, in differently in different national contexts. Uh, the model is guided by the Barna House quality standards. Um, but the, the ways of working can be slightly different and therefore also kind of the path to Barna House uh, might be slightly different. But uh, in many countries, uh, there is a reporting obligation, which means that any suspicion of violence must be reported to the relevant authorities. And uh, if there then is a suspicion of violent crime, the case is referred to Barna House by the relevant authorities. And in most places, when the referral comes, there's an initial planning meeting. And if it's then uh, decided that the, barn, that the child will come to Barna House, the child is often called there uh, within a week to undergo uh, these different processes. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I am known to speak about Barna House for hours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Olivia, for explaining the Barna House model uh, briefly but beautifully. Uh, we have among ourselves uh, Ms. Maria Madalina Tursa, State Councillor for Romania. I would like to request her to share experience and learning from her country. Hello everyone, thank you very much for your kind invitation. Um, I hope you, you hear me. So uh, I'm, very, uh, I'm very happy and impressed by the experience shared by the other panelists. And um, I'd like to say a few words about Romania's experience um, in relation to our topic today. So first of all, I'd like to emphasize the fact that from the point of view of legislation, when it comes to corporal punishment, Romania uh, has made a very significant um, uh, step forward and we are now aligned with the international standards in terms of regulating uh, um, the situation in, uh, in this respect, in the civil code, in the penal code, as well in the uh, special laws that we have with regards to the children. So when it comes to, to legislation, Romania, um, let's say, um, 
it in a in a in a positive uh, posture. Uh, besides this, what I'd like to share to you is that um, Romania is now committed to both to strengthen and to speed up the efforts uh, to end violence against children. And when I'm saying that, I'm referring uh, especially to. To, uh, to two aspects. One of them is uh, that now uh, we succeeded to raise this topic uh, at the highest level of decision making, meaning that we have a dedicated mandate at the level of the government uh, on uh, overseeing the problem of violence against children and uh, uh, that includes also corporal punishment. Um, on the, the second aspect is related uh, to the idea that we are currently developing a multi-sectorial approach in this respect. And I'd like to give you just uh, two examples because the time is short. So first of all, I, uh, I'd like to, to tell you that we are currently um, organizing and implementing the first national uh, uh, support program for children uh, in the context of COVID-19, it is true, but this national program that is uh, supported and endorsed by the Romanian government uh, has two major components. One, one of them is dedicated to the um, psycho-emotional support uh, to the children and uh, with specific services and referral mechanisms and identification and screening that is going to be implemented um, mostly through the school system and with the help of uh, social services. And uh, the other component uh, is related especially to the violence against children uh, that is manifesting unfortunately still uh, in, uh, in the families as well as online. And for this particular uh, component, we are now building um, specific measures and mechanisms that are going to be in place, hopefully at grassroots level, exactly the place where we need to have the specialist present and um, uh, working with the children, both from prevention point of view and from uh, a combating point of view. On the other hand, um, the second uh, aspect that I'd like to mention is related um, to the fact that Romania is now um, undergoing an extensive process of uh, uh, debate and uh, uh, working together on the national strategy for the children's rights here in Romania with the support of UNICEF Romania. And uh, this strategy uh, has specific major goals and objectives related to the uh, strengthening of mechanisms um, uh, to help, you know, uh, in the struggle uh, against violence against children. So um, these are two major aspects that we are building now here in Romania. And I think it is very important that um, we are uh, our focus is raised on the uh, on the mainstream the chief decision making agenda and that um, uh, children are are a priority and uh, uh, we have um, we are in the happy context to have at the same uh, table all the relevant actors in this process, meaning the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Labor, the Ministry of Health. Uh, as well as the professional associations and NGOs working together, both for the uh, national support program that I was telling you, and also uh, for, um, for the national strategy. So in a way, Romania is now entering a new, uh, let's say, chapter uh, where we want to prioritize um, not only children in general, but to address also this very, very uh, important uh, uh, aspect related to the violence against children. Um, so if you feel that uh, you want more details about the national program uh, that I'm coordinating here from the Chancellor of the Prime Minister in Romania, I will be very happy to, uh, to answer to any specific question. 
um, this is uh, for the for the moment, and I'm here for uh, to, to to talk about any of the things that I mentioned before. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, State Councillor uh, Ms. Maria Madalina. Um, thanks for your leadership and commitment to end all violence against children. And it was so inspiring to hear about the multi-sectoral response and all you are doing. So thank you. Uh, now uh, we will have a poll and all the participants, uh, you can participate by clicking on the response uh, that seemed to be right in your context. Uh, we will see the um, question and the uh, responses. So the first question is, how would you describe public opinion on corporal punishment of children in your country? Please click the response that seems relevant in your context. And the responses range from like strongly disapproving to still very common, as we can see. And we can see the results are coming. Let's wait a bit more for more results to come. Thank you for your participation in the poll. So I can see that so far, uh, the corporal punishment is still very common in all areas of children's lives that uh, has been like almost 37% of the participants uh, have said that. And uh, most people strongly disapprove, like that's the list, only 7% or 8%, 9% uh, of people uh, or participants have said that. And, uh, you know, we rarely see corporal punishment in public, 24%. And it's rare for teachers or other professionals to use corporal punishment at 16%. So from the result of this poll, uh, unfortunately, we see that corporal punishment is still so very common. And uh, disapproval of corporal punishment is still quite low. Uh, so we have a long way to go. Uh, and that's why we are here today. We see corporal punishment in public. We are seeing that uh, teachers and professionals are using corporal punishment. And we see it's extremely common in all areas of children's lives. So probably, uh, thank you for your participation in the poll. Uh, we can go to the next question maybe. And the, okay, uh, we are waiting a little bit because uh, all of you will have to see the result of the poll.
And the second question was, once corporal punishment of children has been prohibited in law, what do you think is the most effective way of eliminating violent punishment of children? And here we can see that 36% uh, of the participants say the specific help for parents uh, are needed. And uh, then 26% said uh, uh, that increasing support for parents and carers generally. And 20% 20, 20 of you have said public awareness campaign about the dangers. And 14% have said training professionals. So here again, we can see that um, support for parents uh, has been uh, quite prominent in most of your minds and support for carers also. And of course, uh, we need public awareness and training of professionals. So we can see that um, all those are extremely important when we want to um, implement the legal prohibition of corporal punishment in any setting. So those tell us something about what we need to do while moving forward. We know that uh, corporal punishment is so very prevalent in most of our societies. And although legal prohibition is extremely important, when we have prohibited legally, we need to uh, do a lot in terms of developing people's capacity, in terms of social awareness, and in terms of making it unacceptable. So thank you very much for participating in the poll. And now, um, you know, as we have just uh, seen that most of us consider support to parents to be so very important, uh, I would like to request uh, Professor John Durand from University of Manitoba, Canada and Positive Discipline in Everyday Life uh, to make a presentation. She will talk about supporting nonviolent parenting. Thank you very much, Lila. Distinguished ministers, state representatives, fellow speakers and participants, it's a great honor to take part in this event with you today. The challenges of the 21st century and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development will only be met if we see a total global transformation in the way we think about children. Prohibition of corporal punishment is one component of the change that's needed. And certainly, prohibition is a concrete shift in children's legal status. But it's also a symbol of moving forward from archaic notions of children as commodities or property to full human beings with rights. Parenting is one area where this transformation to thinking about children as rights bearers is urgently needed. So what do we need to do to ensure that children become viewed as full human beings within their families? The prohibition of corporal punishment is often placed in the context of children's rights to protection. And certainly, protection from violence is a fundamental human rights obligation. But respecting children as fully human means more than not hitting and hurting them. It's also about their rights to dignity as human beings, about respecting, validating, and supporting the development of their unique self, their talents, personalities, and sexual identities. Respecting children as fully human is also about their rights to participation in their learning, to expressing their perspectives, and to being heard. So what does this all mean for the concept of positive discipline? In many places, this term means nothing more than replacing physical punishment with emotional punishment. I've seen many positive discipline manuals and toolkits and programs 
that recognize the harm of physical punishment, but they don't demonstrate a grasp of what it means to treat children with dignity or to engage their participation in their learning. In many cases, physical punishment is simply replaced by humiliation, exclusion, and invalidation. For example, forcing children to apologize, sending them to a different room or to stand in the corner or in a hallway, intentionally turning one's back on them, ignoring their needs, and taking away the things they love and value. What are the actual teachings taking place when we do these things? When we force children to apologize, we teach them to suppress their emotions and lie about how they truly feel. This is the opposite of what we know promotes good mental health. When we isolate children, we teach them to obey out of fear of rejection and exclusion. Sending children to time out actually activates the same threat response in their brains as hitting them does. When we ignore children, we teach them that they'll only feel our love when they do as they're told. And when we take things away that they love and value, they learn that they have no power or control. This is an early lesson in relinquishing agency. All of these actions involve the use of power against the child. Children who are bullied, children who have experienced trauma, and girls are particularly vulnerable to the effects of coercion and disempowerment. So many adults might ask, if we don't rely on our power against children, what's left? Well, what's left is treating children as participants in their own learning, as contributors to problem solving. Engaging them in their own learning requires us to recognize the fact that they have perspectives that to them are as valid as our perspectives are to us. It also requires that we truly listen to them. And it requires that we become their mentors as they learn about emotions, perspective taking, communication, and conflict resolution. So rather than using our power against them and forcing them to apologize, we connect with them, listen to their feelings and help them learn ways to express them. Rather than sending them away and instilling fear in them, we engage them communicate with them, hear their point of view, and help them solve the problem. Rather than taking things away from them, we listen, talk, and truly teach them. When we treat them with respect and dignity, we teach them how to do this themselves. The challenge is that most of us were raised with a great deal of punishment. So this transformation requires us to create a new vision of our relationships with our children and our role as parents. We need a great deal of information and support to become comfortable and confident in moving forward to a new vision of discipline. We need our governments to support this transformation through universal access to parent support. Just a few days ago, a recommendation to the World Health Assembly was drafted that calls for support to member states in developing and implementing parenting programs to prevent child maltreatment and promote healthy child development. This is wonderful, but it's very important that we don't continue to promote approaches that dehumanize and disempower children and in turn teach them how to do that to others. Instead, governments should invest in programs that promote creative, autonomous thinking, problem solving, and mental health. This is all the more important during and after the pandemic when so many children have suffered mental health problems due to lack of control over their daily lives. Dr. Ashley Stewart Tufescu and I have identified five principles of rights respecting discipline 
based on articles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. These principles can help us identify those approaches that respect children and their rights. The most fundamental principle is that it's nonviolent, physically and emotionally. It does not rely on power, coercion, or punishment. Second, it must be respectful of children's evolving capacities. This means that we need to understand children's development, how their emotions develop, how their brains develop, and how their understanding of the world develops. Third, it must recognize and respect each child's individuality in terms of their personality, temperament, talents, and sexual identity. It must be focused on supporting the development of the child's true self. Fourth, it must engage the child in the learning and problem-solving process, supporting their agency and autonomous thinking. And finally, it must respect the child's dignity and nurture their sense of worth. Rather than excluding and disempowering children, rights-based discipline demonstrates to children that they are worthy of respect. If we're to meet the challenges of the post-pandemic world, end violence against children and uphold human rights standards, we must embrace this transformation to a concept of discipline as teaching, mentorship, and nurturing children's creative and collaborative problem-solving skills. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Joan, for sharing uh, details on positive discipline, which is very much child rights-based and child-focused as an approach. And uh, I had the privilege of working with you and your team at Positive Discipline in Everyday Life for many years, and hope to come back to you with some questions uh, later on. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, now uh, we have Lourdes Febres Chirenos uh, from Actions for Children Peru. She will share learning on a countrywide commitment to implement the legal prohibition of corporal punishment uh, with a focus on developing capacity of parents and teachers. Buenos días, muchas gracias por la invitación y un saludo especial desde Perú a todos los panelistas y a los participantes en este importante evento. Yo quisiera empezar esta presentación. Eh, por favor, si pueden compartir. Eh, a ver. Gracias. Yo quisiera eh, iniciar esta presentación. Eh, para este, explicarles un poquito ¿no? cómo este, trabajamos para acabar con el castigo corporal en eh, las familias peruanas. ¿no? Y a partir de esto, eh, por favor, pasamos a la siguiente lámina. Bien, eh, lo primero que quiero comentarles es un poco eh, cuáles son las cifras en nuestro país que nos hablan de la situación del castigo, y esto es en base a la data del Instituto Nacional de Estadística e Informática de nuestro país, que es un órgano público que realiza encuestas de seguimiento a los problemas vinculados a las políticas nacionales. Y esto nos dice muy claramente que en el caso de la familia, es decir, cuando un agresor vive con, este, maltrata a un niño con la persona con la que vive, cinco de cada diez niñas y niños de 9 a 11 años alguna vez fueron víctimas de violencia y siete de cada diez adolescentes eh, de 12 a 17 años pasan por la misma situación. Eh, la siguiente, por favor. Y en el caso de eh, la escuela, también la magnitud de la violencia es bastante grande porque tanto en el caso de los niños de 9 a 11 años y de los adolescentes de 12 a 17 años son este, víctimas de violencia en la escuela. Lo importante de esto, y eh, pensamos que es un avance a nivel del país, que eh, sean estadísticas nacionales las que visibilicen este tema. Pasamos a la siguiente lámina, por favor. 
en relación a, este, a cómo es la situación y del castigo físico en nuestro país, yo quisiera señalar algunos antecedentes antes de la, de la dación de la ley contra el castigo físico y humillante, que así se denomina en nuestro país. Eh, en el 2001 y el 2003 se desarrollan varios estudios e investigaciones eh, impulsadas por organizaciones de la sociedad civil, donde eh, se trata de ver cuáles son las percepciones que la sociedad peruana va teniendo frente a esta situación del castigo físico y humillante. Y a partir de las constataciones empezamos a realizar talleres con eh, organizaciones de sociedad civil y con organizaciones de niños para entender mejor cuál es, es esta problemática. Y en 2004 vamos por este, desarrollar una campaña nacional que va con el buen trato hacia los niños, niñas y adolescentes. Y en 2007 lanzamos otra campaña que eh, la denominamos Adiós al castigo físico y humillante. Aproximadamente en el 2009, nosotros como país solicitamos una audiencia a la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos desde las organizaciones de sociedad civil y las organizaciones de niñas, niñas y adolescentes a fin de que este se pudiera poner fin al castigo físico y humillante en nuestro país y además también es para eh, que se pudiera dar eh, la ley. Entonces, entre el 2014 y el, el 2000, desde el 2011 al 2014, se realizan un conjunto de reuniones entre eh, organismos del Comité de Derechos del Niño, de este, miembros del Comité, miembros de la Comisión Interamericana, eh, con el Estado peruano y con el Congreso de la República a fin de incidir en la aprobación del castigo físico y humillante. Hacia el 2015, a inicios del 2015, decidimos hacer un plan de incidencia con un conjunto de organizaciones de sociedad civil y organizaciones de niños a fin de conseguir la promulgación de la ley contra el castigo físico y humillante que la logramos a, a fines del año 2019. La siguiente lámina, por favor. Es entonces... Este, a partir del año 2019, que este, por fin, en diciembre del 2015, eh, logramos la aprobación de la ley contra el castigo físico de humillante, que básicamente por el contexto y la situación política del país, eh, tiene dos aspectos que son fundamentales. Uno que tiene que ver con la prohibición del castigo y, eh, en segundo lugar, la promoción del buen trato. Sin embargo, la ley no era suficiente para poder desarrollar toda una estrategia de implementación y de eh, desarrollar un conjunto de competencias a nivel de otros ministerios y era necesaria la aprobación del reglamento de la ley contra el castigo físico y humillante que básicamente establece responsabilidades en el Ministerio de la Mujer y Poblaciones Vulnerables que es el ente rector del sistema de protección de niños, niñas y adolescentes en nuestro país, pero además establece responsabilidades y competencias para intervenir en esta materia a nivel de otros ministerios como educación, trabajo, salud, justicia, derechos humanos, así como de gobiernos locales y regionales. Y finalmente también dentro del 2018, se crean los lineamientos para la gestión de la convivencia escolar y la prevención y atención de la violencia. Aquí es importante señalar que se establece el protocolo de atención para casos de castigo físico en las instituciones educativas. Pero no solo basta con normas nacionales, sino que también en nuestro país se impulsa, eh, podemos pasar a la siguiente lámina, eh, se impulsa la este, dación también de normas que se dan a nivel local y algunas acciones que se desarrollan en este nivel. Aquí tenemos las ordenanzas municipales que tienen que ver fundamentalmente con dos cosas, la prohibición del castigo físico y humillante y la prevención del castigo. A nivel del país se han 
este, algunas municipalidades cuentan con este tipo eh, de ordenanzas y esto también a nivel local eh, nos da el respaldo para trabajar eh, con familias donde se realizan talleres con padres y con madres, pero también se hace promoción de buenas prácticas. Y la constitución de redes locales, eh, redes que están impulsadas por organismos de sociedad civil, eh, tenemos los comités multisectoriales por los derechos de los niños, que eh, cuentan con un respaldo del Estado y que aglutinan también a organizaciones de sociedad civil y organizaciones del Estado trabajando en el nivel local por los derechos de los niños, niñas y adolescentes y además se fortalece eh, eh, las capacidades de los integrantes de estos comités y de otros actores eh, locales. ¿Podemos pasar a la siguiente lámina, por favor? Algo que quisiera destacar también son algunas acciones desarrolladas desde la sociedad civil a este nivel. Eh, hay todo un esfuerzo por fortalecer a la sociedad civil en eh, la temática del castigo físico y humillante, pero un hito importante dentro del trabajo es que en el año 2017 se constituye el grupo impulsor para poner fin a la violencia en el Perú en el marco de eh, la Alianza Global para poner eh, fin al castigo físico y humillante al, a nivel nacional. Una de las acciones importantísimas que se desarrolla desde, desde el grupo impulsor es incidir fuertemente en el gobierno para la aprobación del reglamento de la ley contra el castigo físico y humillante y además que participa en la elaboración del plan nacional contra la violencia eh, que es uno de los compromisos que asume el estado peruano como país al constituirse en país eh, pionero para enfrentar el castigo físico y humillante y actualmente nos encontramos en un fuerte proceso de incidencia para la aprobación y la dación este, del plan contra la violencia hacia niños, niñas y adolescentes. Y entre el 2015 y el 2020 se inicia este, varias, este, eh, el programa de disciplina este, positiva y campañas masivas también sobre estos temas. Eh, aspectos, ¿no? Pasamos a la siguiente lámina, por favor. Eh, lo que yo quiero oh, destacar aquí con el programa de la formación en disciplina positiva es el importante esfuerzo que realizamos algunas instituciones eh, como Save the Children, eh, Paz de Esperanza y Acción por los Niños, eh, en la formación de padres de familia en disciplina positiva en la crianza cotidiana y hacemos una fuerte incidencia en eh, el Ministerio de la Mujer, pero también en los Ministerios de eh, Salud y el Ministerio de Educación a fin de que la disciplina positiva se pueda este, convertir en un componente importante en las políticas públicas para promover el buen trato. En ese camino lo que hemos hecho es la formación de facilitadores en disciplina positiva. Hemos formado a 100 especialistas de la Dirección Nacional de Salud Mental del eh, Ministerio eh, de Salud a nivel este, nacional que trabajan fuertemente con población y a 50 especialistas del Programa Integral Nacional de Bienestar eh, Familiar que este, está a cargo del Ministerio de la Mujer y Poblaciones Vulnerables. Además, hemos desarrollado también otras acciones. En el 2019 capacitamos a 250 docentes de tutoría de las distintas regiones del país en coordinación con el Ministerio de Educación en Metodologías de la Disciplina Positiva y ahora estamos este, preparando eh, la formación de docentes en disciplina positiva porque creemos que es un mecanismo fundamental para enfrentar la violencia en la escuela. Pasamos a la siguiente lámina, por favor. 
En este marco, desde el año 2016, estas mismas organizaciones estamos impulsando la campaña a Atrévete a Criar con Amor. Aquí hemos desarrollado primero un proceso de eh, sensibilización a periodistas de los importantes medios de comunicación del país, eh, quienes han difundido este, mensajes para prevenir el castigo físico este, humillante y los difundieron eh, en español, en quechua, en aymara, dada la diversidad cultural también que tiene nuestro país. Hay un trabajo bastante importante con niños, niñas y adolescentes y su involucramiento en esta temática. Hemos producido varios videos con la participación de los niños, niñas y adolescentes, los cuales han tenido una reproducción muy importante en las redes sociales. Hemos trabajado también para esta campaña este, un conjunto de spot publicitarios para sensibilizar a padres y madres de familia y un conjunto de afiches este, promocionales para este, eh, llegar a diferentes puntos del país y a los sectores, tanto a padres, a madres de familia, como también a operadores que intervienen directamente con niños, niñas y adolescentes. Esto ha sido un proceso muy importante. Es una campaña que de, la desarrollamos todos los años a partir del 2016 y ha sido un gran este, mecanismo para sensibilizar a la opinión pública y también a algunos operadores sobre la prevención del castigo físico y humillante. La siguiente lámina, por favor. Eh, también este, en este proceso hemos eh, desarrollado un conjunto de acciones y visibilización en medios de comunicación. Eh, ustedes este, los pueden ver. Eh, tanto con la participación de las organizaciones promotoras desde la sociedad civil, pero este también eh, desde la participación de los mismos niños, niñas y adolescentes. Esto ha sido muy importante para nosotros porque nos ha permitido llegar a diferentes espacios a nivel nacional eh, a partir de eh, estas entrevistas en medios nacionales. Eh, muchas gracias, eso es todo lo que les quería comentar y agradecerles por la oportunidad de contarles un poquito la experiencia de Perú. Gracias. Uh, thank you very much, Lourdes, uh, for sharing the, sharing the Peruvian experience and uh, you know, bringing civil society perspective to this uh, discussion. I shall come back to you with some questions later on. Thank you. Um, now, I would like to request Dr. Divya Naidu from Save the Children South Africa to share experience on, on ending corporal punishment in schools. Divya. Thank you, Laila. Um, good afternoon, everybody from a beautiful, sunny South Africa. Um, South Africa has emerged as a global actor and attained middle income status. However, we continue to be a country that has so much of violence and is regarded as one of the most violent countries in the world. Children face high levels of violence in the home, at schools, and in the communities that they live in at the hands of the very people who are supposed to be caring for and protecting them that is their parents and their educators. The problem is exacerbated by a um, public attitude that corporal punishment is, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. It's exacerbated by a, a belief that corporal punishment is not actually violence. Um, and, and therefore, and also that hitting children is, is very acceptable way of raising children and a necessary way to ensure that children can learn. So this presentation will outline the journey that was undertaken by Save the Children South Africa in our work with schools over a period from 2017 to 2020. Um, I will highlight the processes that we went through some of the challenges, the lessons we've learned, as well as the successes. 
Next slide. So the process we, we followed was actually um, in various steps and, and just to easily describe it. We commenced the process by ensuring that we needed to get buy-in from the Department of Education. And that involved us going in and meeting with them, introducing Save the Children as an organization um, and telling them about the work that we do as an organization and our plans to work with schools in, in the communities. Um, this resulted in us obtaining written approval from the district directors um, to work in a select set of schools. Similar meetings were held each year where we gave them feedback on what we did in the previous year, the successes, what we had achieved so far, and again, getting consent to work with a different set of schools. And each year we accumulated, we continued to work with schools we had worked with in the initial year, and then we built on that. Step two involved getting buy-in from school-based senior management teams or the SMTs as they call them in the schools. Um, and so what happened was then we had to go school by school, visiting, have a discussion with the senior management team, informing them that the program had been approved by the district's directors and inviting them to a positive discipline awareness workshop. At this half a day workshop, we confirmed the nature and the extent of violence in schools across the country. We engaged them to confirm what was the nature and extent of violence within their respective schools. We talked about the legal framework, and this ranged from talking to them about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, the South African Constitution, um, as well as more specifically the Schools Act of 1996, which very explicitly in Section 10 banned corporate punishment in, in the schools. Um, this was a real eye opener for the senior management teams, and they immediately agreed to us running training programs with the entire staff from their respective schools. And that led on to the third step. We facilitated a two day positive discipline training with the educators. In the first year, we, we, we had to, we, we focused on the entire staff from a particular school at a given time. And because it meant taking the educators away from schools, the agreement was that we would run the program on a Friday and a Saturday. Um, so educators gave some time and they were given a day from the department to be able to close schools and, and to attend the training. But as we went on over the years, we evolved that model. And then we chose, we clustered schools and about 50% of staff from two or three schools would attend a particular training and then the, rest of the staff will attend the second round of training. In that way, we still covered the entire staff, but we went in phases with reaching all of the educators. Save the Children works with an ecological model because we believe that the child belongs to a family which lives in a community within a society. And therefore we cannot just focus on one particular component of the system that is the educators, we have to work in a broader context. Children were, were key to this process. And so we drew in leadership groups from within the schools. So for example, the representative council of learners, the prefects, or in some schools in South Africa have what we call soul buddies. So we brought in those children from those leadership groups, ran violence prevention training programs with them so they understood issues engage children in dialogue to hear from them about what the concerns and the problems they were experiencing, as well as we had assembly talks so we could reach large numbers in schools, just covering issues around violence prevention in the school. During the educator training, um, very often the issue of the lack of parental involvement was placed um, on the table by, by the educators. And so we very happily offered to run parenting programs with the, with the parents, but we asked the school to facilitate and support that process. So we got them to invite the parents to the school to come in in groups. In that way, we got a free venue. There was no cost involved in that. Uh, and they did all the logistics. Um, it's what we call sharing the workload. 
Um, we facilitated these positive parenting awareness workshops with the parents. We gave them an understanding of what positive parenting is about, and we gave them some tools that they could take away. One of the things we were very mindful about is that when you talk to children about their rights and they understand the issues, children are going to seek help. And therefore, we also did some work in the community with the local civil society organizations so that they could respond with quality services to the children. So what were some of the lessons, the challenges, and our successes? We can go to the next slide. Okay, the first thing we, we learned was the critical importance of building relationships. Um, and, and that relationship we built with our departments of education was, was very key. And that was based on integrity, professionalism, and absolute delivery on promises. So when we said we were going to do something, we were there and we did it to a high standard. And what we found was in subsequent years that we got really good support from the department themselves, where we could were invited to piggyback on some of their meetings to engage senior management and to get their buy into programs. So we didn't have to go school by school thereafter. The second critical lesson we learned was that having a law in place does not automatically mean that, that we would have attitudinal and behavior changes. So when we started our positive discipline programming and training with educators, they would arrive on day one, a lot of skepticism, this is not going to work with children in our community was a common line we heard. However, by the end of the training, we found that they had started to change their attitudes. They, and they were saying to us, yes, they felt better equipped to be able to go back to support children and to do something in the schools. The key to what we were doing was we asked them at the end of the training was to go and test it out with only one child. What we hoped was when that succeeded, then they would be willing to try it out with other children as well. Child participation was certainly enhanced um, because children themselves, after we ran training with them, were then became very enthusiastic to start to run programs themselves. Um, so for example, they'll go back and give feedback to other children at their schools about what they had learned. Um, in one school with the support of the educators, we had already trained um, children organized a violence prevention awareness program on their own in the school for, for the entire, um, all of the children at their schools. In 2019, we organized a safe schools conference. Um, and here we tried some new things. We invited schools that we were not working with that were involved in other projects and save the children um, to the conference. They were just schools that other projects were working with. And they came in and they were amazed at the work we were doing. And they invited us then to come and run more training programs with staff from, from schools in, in those areas. Um, we also invited schools that we plan to work with in 2020 to the conference. Um, and, and when we had the meeting with the senior management, they were happy to have us coming to the schools to run programs with their staff. It all didn't go very well. There were, there were struggles along the way. There were last minute cancellations. And I think we all know some of the difficulties. But when we measured the change that we saw, and there's just two examples I want to illustrate because I'm running out of time, is we saw changes in the behavior of educators. So for example, when we ran focus group discussions with educators, one which was a really nice story told us that she had found that, that she started to change her own attitude. She calmed down and as a result, children uh, were a lot calmer and more receptive. And she gave us a funny story of how when she started to get angry, they'd sing her favorite song and make her laugh. A child who was involved in our program shared with us how he had been a bully. He admitted he was that way. But after participating in the program, he started to realize that he was violating the rights of other children. And so he became a champion for child rights at his school. So I just hope that in sharing 
what we've done in South Africa. Will, will you take away something from this? And you too are inspired um, in the work that you are doing in your own country. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Divya. Probably I will come back to you on the question on children's participation a bit later on. Uh, thank you. Our last speaker for today is Bess Herbert from End Violence. Uh, she will talk about key components of a strategy to eliminate violent punishment of children. Thank you, Leila. I'm just quickly moving from one slideshow to another. Um, hello, okay. So thank you so much, everybody, distinguished ministers and representatives, fellow speakers and participants for such a useful and encouraging discussion about eliminating corporal punishment of children. I work at the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, specifically on corporal punishment. And this year, as part of the Together to End Violence campaign, with all our partners, we're calling for accelerated action on all forms of violence against children, including prohibition and elimination of corporal punishment as a key obligation and strategy in ending the violence that so many children experience worldwide. I'd like to talk briefly about putting prohibition of corporal punishment into practice and introduce you to our new guidance briefing that we're launching today. First of all, I'd like to address what's the main purpose of prohibiting all corporal punishment of children. So there are several really important reasons for passing laws to ban corporal punishment, but the main one is education and prevention. A prohibiting law sends a really clear message that it is no longer acceptable to use any level of violence in raising and educating children. It's no more legally or socially acceptable to hit a child than to hit anybody else. Over time, this clear message begins to bring about a change in attitudes and practices, also helping to increase respect for children across society and decrease tolerance of all other forms of violence and mistreatment as well. The main purpose of prohibition is not to punish parents and other caregivers. The Committee on the Rights of the Child has been very clear that laws banning corporal punishment should be implemented with children's best interests at the forefront. And this means that children's parents shouldn't be prosecuted, punished or separated from them unless it is absolutely essential in order to keep the child safe. Guidance can be provided to child protection workers, police and others about how to respond to incidents of corporal punishment. And that where the child is not in danger, it's an opportunity to provide education, support and other interventions. A clear ban brings the opportunity to engage at a much earlier stage, rather than waiting for significant abuse or severe violence before intervening. And in countries where corporal punishment has been banned, we find no evidence of increased prosecution of parents and carers. So we know the aim of prohibition is to change attitudes and behaviours, but how is that law put into practice? Our new implementation guidance out today, and someone will share a link to it in the chat, um, we talk about five broad steps that we think are needed. The first step is to enact a law that explicitly prohibits all corporal punishment of children in all settings of their lives and removes any legal defences that would allow an adult to use violent punishment on a child. The second step is to develop a plan for how the new law will be communicated and put into practice. The plan can focus just on corporal punishment or be part of a wider plan addressing violence against children or child protection. Including corporal punishment within existing plans means that limited resources can be maximized and duplication avoided. It works well to use existing community-based child protection, public health and education programs, reaching more people at grassroots level. The plan should be costed and allocated the necessary resources, including enough for long-term campaigning for social norm change. And the plan should be multi-sectoral, allowing for coordination between all the national and local services working with and for children and families, with a coordinating mechanism, for example, a multi-sectoral working group. 
The third step is communication and awareness raising. And this is a critical part of the effort to end violent punishment of children. And it requires sustained action, usually over many years. Society-wide high profile campaigns are needed to raise awareness of the law, explaining why it's been introduced and offering support for behavior and attitude change. Target audiences and key messages should be identified, specific obstacles considered, and the most effective and achievable communication methods adopted. It's well known that the Swedish government put information about the new law on milk cartons that families had on their breakfast table, but it could be more effective in your country to use radio adverts or murals on walls, for example. Information should be translated into local languages and child-friendly formats. Communication can be built into all the points of contact between the government and parents and families, such as birth, registration, vaccinations, etc. Information and training should be delivered to all professionals working with, with and for children and families, including guidance about how to respond to corporal punishment. The fourth step is to support positive non-violent parenting. Enacting and telling people about the law brings a perfect opportunity to provide information and support to parents, carers and others to help them adopt non-violent approaches. This can be delivered in a wide range of ways, in-person or remote parenting courses, one-to-one -one interventions, prenatal parenting support, information in the media, parent helplines, etc. There is now strong evidence that with effective support, most parents can successfully adopt positive, non-violent methods of raising their children, and they report great satisfaction in doing that. And finally, stage five, monitoring and evaluating the success and challenges of implementing the law. And importantly, assessing whether there has been a reduction in violence against children and hearing children's views and feedback. Ideally, this is an ongoing process, starting with baseline data gathered before the law has been passed or shortly afterwards, followed by gathering comparable data every few years. Evaluation helps to identify problems and gaps, particular successes, and to refocus activities as needed, leading to more efficient use of resources and providing robust data for policymakers and budget holders. We go into more detail about all these steps in the guidance briefing, and you can also find lots more information and resources about measures to end violence against children in the INSPIRE package and the pathfinding process, all available on the End Violence website. So finally, what is the impact of prohibiting corporal punishment? We've already heard some speakers talk very eloquently about this. Um, there are many countries we don't have research evidence for, particularly low and middle income countries, and we really need that research. However, the countries that have studied the impact of the ban have found strong evidence that when prohibition is enacted and implementation measures put in place, there is a reliable and ongoing reduction in the approval and use of corporal punishment over many years. And this slide shows just a few examples of this. And you can note the example featuring Japan at the bottom, that the 17% reduction in approval of corporal punishment actually represents around 17 million adults. So just one year after the law has come into force, there's already a really big positive impact for many children. Violence against children, including its most common form, violence as punishment, is shockingly widespread with huge long-term costs, both to the individual and society. But I think everything we've heard today shows that it's really possible to make substantial progress in eliminating corporal punishment of children. And it's not that complicated, but it does require political will and some long-term commitment. Thank you very much for your attention and your participation today. I look forward to working with you all as we continue to make progress in ending violent punishment of children. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bess. I hope that the guidance launched today will be really helpful for all of us in implementing legal prohibition of corporal punishment. Thanks. Uh, now we have uh, some time for um, question and answer with our panelists. 
I would like to ask the first question to Joan. Um, uh, Joan, during your presentation, you said that transformation from punishment to positive discipline requires us to create a new vision of our relationship with children. I think that's extremely fundamental, very critical. But we also know there are many misconceptions. Sometimes people feel concerned that children will end up wild and undisciplined if corporal punishment is abundant. Uh, how can we address this? Could you please share from your long years of experience? <laughs> That's a very good question and certainly a very common one. And I think there are a number of different responses to it. First of all, there's the research that shows that corporal punishment actually exacerbates children's aggression, antisocial behavior. And that's, uh, that, that's just not even contested anymore. There are so many studies in so many regions of the world that show the same thing over and over and more and more research is showing that that's a causal relationship. Um, and the reason is, well, probably several. One is that, that corporal punishment provides a model of that behavior. It should, provides a model of aggression. It shows children that this is what you do when somebody's doing something that you don't like, or that, you know, if somebody is weaker than you are, this is how you can treat them. So it's, it's just a very clear, explicit model. And every time a child experiences it, they've lost a chance to learn another form of conflict resolution. Also, it puts children into a into a state of threat. So it activates their stress response system. And they the more they experience that, the more difficulty they have learning how to regulate that. So they're more likely to respond impulsively when parents do this to them or teachers. Um, and also it's building resentment inside the child that can't be expressed because they're afraid. So they're building up a lot of resentment and hostility that they can't express back to the adults who hurt them. So they take it out on other people. So actually the chances of a child um, hurting other people, running wild or whatever we think of are greater when they're hurt by the people that they trust because we've destroyed that trust and they then they gravitate toward people who won't hurt them such as uh, they could be peers who um, also might have learned how to bully so we're teaching them how to bully and that's really the last thing we want to be doing i think also it's important to remember that corporal punishment doesn't exist everywhere that it was not part of the indigenous cultures that were colonized. It's a piece of colonization that was used to oppress and suppress. And the more we keep doing that to children, the more we are prolonging that process of, of oppression. So um, yeah, the, the best way we can help children learn how to regulate themselves is to show them how it's done. So when we regulate our frustration and anger, and we help them to see how we're doing that, and we teach them and mentor them and how to do that, the more likely they are to learn how to do that themselves. Uh, thank you very much, Joan, uh, for explaining it so clearly. And we know that when uh, children face corporal punishment, they're at increased risk or more vulnerable of becoming the perpetrators or victims of violence in their adulthood. So if we want to end the intergenerational cycle of violence, we must end corporal punishment of children today. So thank you. Fundamental. Uh, I would like to come to Divya. I know Divya, you work a lot on developing the capacity of children uh, so that they understand their rights and they also know how to protect themselves. And you touched on children's participation in your presentation. Could you elaborate a little bit more, uh, like how children can be involved in the work to eliminate violent uh, punishment? Thank you, Leila. Um, Save the Children South Africa takes child participation very seriously. And so we, we engage children in a, in, a, in a range of activities in terms of participation. 
So we engage children at a very grassroots level. And the example I illustrated was at a school level, for instance, where we run the training programs for children. And part of the training, the safe schools training that we engage them in, is then at the end of it, they need to develop a plan on how they're going to implement and what they're going to do in their school. So, so that's at the one level, very much at, at a grassroots level. When we work with parents, um, part of that also is then we encourage parents and we help them understand the importance of child participation in everyday life in the home. So they also come up with a plan on what they're going to do. And, and, it's, it, and, and parents will sometimes say, but it's not possible to talk to children about how we're going to spend our budget and how do we do things. But we cover those kinds of things as very basic examples at a very grassroots level. <clears throat> then at, an, at a higher level, children, then there's, there's a lot of engagement of children where they have been trained to understand how to engage in the media, how to understand what their rights are, they understand content around violence and what that means. And so children then plan activities amongst themselves um, within their, at, at a very community level. And, and it is now Child Protection Week in South Africa this week, and children across the country have been organizing event, awareness events in their own communities. At a higher level, children have also been involved um, in, in, in more leadership roles. So children have been trained around to understand leadership and Save the Children has partnered with the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, which hosts the Nelson Mandela Children's Parliament on an annual basis. And so children have been prepared to, to participate in that where children physically sit at parliament, um, deliber uh, deliberate on, on issues that affect them and make presentations then to parliamentarians on, on issues that they have. One of the very higher level engagements that we've had children involved in was in South Africa, where Save the Children had brought together children to write the first child-led complementary report. Um, and, and that was submitted to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, and, and that was a very big achievement for children in the country. So as I said, children's participation is at a very grassroots level where there's large numbers of children who are engaging to a very high level at a global level where children can make presentations um, in, in terms of uh, submissions um, around the UN, um, UNCRC. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Divya. I think it's extremely important for all of us to remember, like government and civil society and media, all of us need to engage with children meaningfully and actively in our journey to prevent and end uh, corporal punishment of children in all settings. Uh, so thank you. Can I just add one other thing, Leila? Please. Save the Children South Africa is also at this point there's a discussion at the board where we can create an advisory board of children who will engage with Save the Children board members and, and, and in terms of decision making. So we take that very seriously, even us as an organization where we want children to participate, where they give feedback to our strategy, but also to give advice and guidance and talk to our board. On an annual basis, we have our CEO accountability, where our CEO, Steve Miller, who's present here today, uh, will listen to what children have to say and account to them for the work we've been doing with children. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that inspiring example of meaningful children's participation. Uh, we have come almost towards the end of our uh, session, and uh, I would like to offer many thanks to all the speakers for a very informative and rich discussion. Special thanks to the panelists from Mongolia, Honduras, and Romania. We are grateful for your participation and the opportunity to learn from your government's commitment and leadership. Thanks to the participants as well for your active contribution. While I was listening to all the presenters, I was reminded of all the children whom I met in different parts of the world who express how profoundly sad they feel to be punished. There is huge negative impact of punishment in their lives. It's our responsibility to end this unacceptable practice. It's possible for all countries to take effective action in ending corporal punishment. We have positive examples across diverse economic regions, cultural and religious settings. 
And during today's event, it was inspiring to learn from different contexts how prohibition of corporal punishment can be implemented. We know the solutions, but we also know that political will and commitment from all of us will be needed to implement them. I hope that what we have learned today will energize all of us to work more on ending corporal punishment of children. And enacting prohibition fulfills children's right to equal protection under the law. And the aim of the prohibition is not to punish parents or others, but rather to bring about a cultural shift in how a society regards and treats its children. And children deserve to be treated better. This year's Together to End Violence campaign is our chance to call for an end to the violent punishment of children. We call on all governments to take the fundamental stake in protecting children and building nonviolent childhoods and societies by enacting and implementing prohibition of all corporal punishment of children without any delay. We are asking everyone from the governments and organizations to individuals to sign a statement calling for the accelerated action on prohibition and elimination of corporal punishment, which is available in English, Spanish, and French. And I hope those of you who participated have signed the statement and will spread the word among your friends, colleagues, and families. I found today's event to be very energizing. Let us stop tolerating violence against children. I am hoping that all of us will act urgently to end corporal punishment of children by 2030, in line with SDG 16.2 and other human rights obligations. I thank you.